Gideon. And then the second one is the reference of the story of Moses. And the Bible records where the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. The other reference is, is Moses, where God comes to Moses and gives him instructions to lead the children of Israel. And Moses said, but I stutter. In both of these instances, the individuals who were called and assigned focused on, in on their problem. But the inter interesting response of God is that God never focuses in on your problem. He focuses on, on your potential. So he said to Gideon, in spite of the fact that Gideon was in a depressed state, he called him mighty man of valor. And so today I want to share a little bit on the five P's from your problem to your promise. Moses said, I can't speak, I stutter. Gideon said, I am the least of my tribe. But yet, God said to both of them, go and deliver your people. So he ignored their problem, focused in on their potential. Once he focused in on their potential, he reminded them of their purpose. He said, you are here for this reason and for this season. So in order for us to get from our problem to our promise, we, ha we have to recognize, first of all, the potential and then understand our purpose. But even when you understand your potential and your purpose, there's a process. And sometimes the process, not sometimes, often the process is very painful. You know, all of us, we have a vision of what we want to accomplish, what we want to see, what we want to see for the country. And everything begins with a problem. In fact, your problems are actually your launching pad. Because every successful business is created out of a problem that's being solved. I remember years ago, when somebody mentioned uh, the Aquafure company, before that time, there was a problem. You had these big five-gallon bottles and women and children and so on. If they had to take it to their house, it was impossible to do. But somebody figured out a way to solve that problem. So we had a business being born. But the process is often painful. Sometimes you go through struggle. Sometimes you go through loneliness. Sometimes you, you go through setbacks. But at the end of the day, if you learn how to persevere through the pain, then you arrive at the promise. So I want to encourage you today to remember these five Ps. It begins with a problem, but God normally shows you your potential. He explains your purpose, takes you through a process that involves a lot of pain, but if you persevere, you end in your promise. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you once again for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to conduct the business of the nation again. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for guidance. Lord, we thank you for order, decency, and we just pray that out of these discussions and debates today, we would have a favorable outcome that benefits our people. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our Father, who in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, upon the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Dr. Hugh Minnick, Peter Turnquist, Ren Simonet, Desmond Bannister, Ren Rubel, Jeffrey Lloyd, Dr. Greenplan, Marvin Dane, Frankie Campbell, Benicio Diagula, Michael Pintard, Darren Hempfield, Ramal Guerrero, Anisha Rose, Renville Rose, Ellsworth Johnson, Philip Davis, Vaughn Miller, Patricia Parker Edson, Aaron Lewis, Carlton Bole, James Aldrich, Travis Robinson, Adrian Gibson, Ronald Saunders, Curtis McElfine, Hank Johnson, Mark Green, Michael Fox, Miriam Refn Emanuel, Ruth Chipman, Ruben Ramey, Ricky Matthews, Stan Don Cartwright, Janel Ferguson, Bennett Hannah Martin, Pricewell Fork, Chester Cooper. Mr. Blower. Can I can I see the minutes for the last meeting? Good morning, honorable members. Honorable members, when we last met, um, I made a statement from the chair. I was seeking to the, the minutes for the meeting so that I can verify the position taken. Now, we don't have the minutes available yet. The clerk, I guess, would would present those meet, minutes to me at the next sitting. But as I recall, I indicated that the issues that led to the disagreement uh, were resolved. And those issues were the sanitization of the parliament as well as the pre-testing of the members of staff of the parliament. Those issues, in my estimation, were resolved. Notwithstanding, in my estimation, in the resolution of those issues, more disturbing issues developed in that on the 30th of April, members were asked to be tested as well as staffers were asked to be tested. The result of those tests I'm instructed, for the most part, were given by word of mouth, either by a doctor at the office of the Prime Minister, or by the Secretary to the Cabinet, and to some staff members by the Human Resources Manager. Now, what disturbed me was, first of all, was that there was no communication with the clerk of this parliament who is still able to communicate by via technology 
and I keep in constant communication with him, and no information was passed to the, on to the speaker. So members were able to come to the last meeting on the presumption that they were tested negative without any documentation of those tests. Now, the most disturbing part to me was to discover that certain persons were called and were notified that they were negative with no condi conditions attached. While other persons were called and informed that they were negative, but that they should not attend work or this parliament until the contract tracing process was complete. And there again, no one contacted the speaker or the clerk with respect to this process. Now, one of the members of this staff was called in out of the quarantine that was established by the speaker and was told that she was protected because of the antibodies that had developed in her system as a consequence of her having contracted the virus. She was called in out of the quarantine. But after she did the test on Friday, the same person who was called in out of the quarantine was told that she cannot attend the parliament and take her seat at the clerk's table, even though she was negative. Now, that caused me to reflect on the circumstance of September 2020, when that very person had contracted the virus. When the speaker asked for members to be tested, uh, some of you may re remember this, a new COVID protocol was released by the cabinet that only those persons who were in the presence of that individual for more than 15 minutes needed to take the test. And see, I am concerned because we are dealing with COVID-19 and we cannot be playing games with people's lives. Now, there was an impossible for anyone to determine whether they were in the presence of the young staff member who had contracted that virus in September because no one knew that she had it until we got the test. But because the speaker requested that members be tested, a new protocol evolved. The level of disrespect and dishonesty is, is, is something that I am severely challenged with because we're dealing we're dealing with COVID-19. Now the result of telling that individual that she cannot attend this parliament is that the two persons who are considered loyal to the speaker are denied the right to be in this parliament. While a member from the cabinet whom I just dismissed this morning and, and, and notified her without and explained to her that it had not, it has nothing to do with her and that she should not have been dragged into this situation. Members of the cabinet are allowed to come with no condition after the test. But members, staffers who are loyal to the speaker and should be loyal to the speaker if they understand the Westminster model of governance 
are forced out of this parliament. And I'm supposed to just sit idly by and accept such a circumstance. We're dealing with COVID-19. We cannot appear or be seen to be functioning in this way. How could you call someone and tell them that they're protected because they have the antibodies one week and the next week you call them and tell them even though they tested negative they cannot attend to this parliament and the speaker is not uh, um, appraised of that decision the speaker has to go and dig and question and thank god for some of my legal training i was able to to glean answers out of persons as to what is really going on Um, and so, while those two issues were resolved, there are many unresolved issues. As a matter of fact, it's time for the staff of this parliament to be paid there over time. For four years now. Four years. It's time for this parliament to pass a resolution so that we can we can meet in hybrid form face to face or virtually it's time it's time for the independence of this parliament and for the executive branch of the government to stop dragging this parliament around like a dinghy boat it's time for the independence of this parliament Now, you know, I don't want anybody to misconstrue my statements. I've seen a lot of response with respect to me indicating that if you don't want a war, don't start one. And I say that because as far as I'm concerned, this is an Ephesians 6 and 12 moment in this parliament. This is a matter of light and darkness, good and evil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness and wickedness and spiritual, spiritual, spiritual wickedness in high places. But I want the young men of Nassau Village and the young men of, of Camp Road, young men of Bain Town and Pinewood, I want them to understand that the speaker is not advocating taking up arms in, re in resolution of these matters because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is not a matter of personalities. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not carnal. This country is at a stage where it needs a change. Now, Honorable Member for Kalani, a number of persons have been contacting me with respect to the government's position on this matter dating back to the, ex the notice of the, con of the clerk contracting this virus. So now, Honorable Member Fukulani, I call on you to speak to the Bahamian people and give the government position on these matters. And in particular, this matter that happened at the office of the Prime Minister on the 30th of April. This, this hatch plan and execution thereof. Um, 
The people deserve to know and have an answer with respect to that. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today we're debating two bills, and I want to debate them as a compendium. And that is a bill for an act to amend the insurance. Honorable law. Member Fukalani, I'm not at that stage yet. I am still at Speaker's communication. I'm calling on you, Honorable Member Fukalani, to give an explanation to this parliament and to the people of this country with respect to these issues. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Which stage of here? And speaker's communication. And, and, and I'm extending to you as leader of this country and the member for Kalani. This is being with all due respect. I've always been told that communications are not to be contentious, and therefore I would respond to that at the appropriate time. I don't see the contention in this communication. I don't believe I was contentious. I believe I laid out the facts as they were brought to me. And I believe that we are at the position now where it is very apparent that the legislative branch of this government is Speaker. honorable member for Yamakro. I have not yet finished dealing with the member for Kalani. Mr. Speaker, but I stand, Mr. Speaker, because I feel. And but, I but, but honorable member for, for Yamakro. I, I stand on the point of privilege. But you have not been yet re yeah, recognized. Yeah. Honorable member for Yamakra, what is your point of order? Because I stand firstly on the point of privilege. I am a member of the cabinet. The point of privilege is a number of statements were made this morning. By whom, Honorable Member? By yourself, Mr. Speaker. So, Honorable Member, you're suggesting that I'm being contentious in what I presented? No, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm just making an observation and inviting uh, you to uh, consider, Speaker. My submission to speak on the point of privilege. I sat here this morning, Mr. Speaker, and a number of assertions were made about executive dishonesty, but an honor. Good. Uh, honorable member, let me stop you there. I, I never made any assertion from this chair about the dishonesty of the executive. Mr. Speaker. Then that, that is your interpretation of what I said, but I never made any assertions. Of dishonesty. Mr. Speaker, you spoke about your independence. <clears throat> Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Southern Shore. Speaker, I want to move for a suspension of the business of the House for comments. I second that movement. Honorable Members, it has been moved and seconded that the business of this House be suspended for 10 minutes. If many members who are in favor will remain seated, those who oppose will stand. The business of this house stands suspended for approximately 10 minutes. Okay. Introduction and swearing in of new members. Laying of documents by ministers. Statements and communications by ministers. Communications by the clerk. Messages from the Governor General. Messages from the Senate. Motion for leave of absence, leave to resign, seat, and new writs. Presentations of petition. Presentation of reports of committees. 
adoption of reports of committees. First reading of bills. Second reading and committal of bills. You can recognize this honorable member for Kalani. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, two bills were about to debate. Um, we're going to debate them as a compendium of bills. That is a bill for an act to amend the insurance act and a bill for an act to amend the securities industry act. Um, speaker, before I speak about the, the bills, I only want to remind the public that we are still in a pandemic and uh, I urge them to continue avoiding large gatherings adhere to the protocols and the amount of parties and social events that are occurring that are trying to decrease on such events and the police will be doing their job there and their COVID, COVID officers. On Friday, we are going to be traveling to Exuma, at which time we would be undergoing the groundbreaking for the new airport to commence in Exuma. And while in Exuma, I intend to tour the facilities and look at the ground sites that we plan to build a new township moving forward. I want to remind and inform the Exumians that the new road that we um, are building, that the delay was as a result of the asphalt having to be transported here to the new province to ensure it underwent the proper scientific testing and the quality is maintained so that their roads would last for a long time. And um, I also want to remind them that I will tour the health facility um, so as to determine how we would move towards the establishment of um, telemedicine and establishment of a particular unit responsible for that so that the emergency flights and landing that we have today as a result of health will not be as necessary moving forward. Most of all, Mr. Speaker, I also want to say how happy I am to report that the vaccination program for farmyards, especially at Zuma, has been very well and they've been very cooperative. And um, I look forward to receiving my second jab or vaccination shot very soon. And um, while there, I will try to convince them and the remainder of farm is why it's necessary to receive the vaccine as opposed to the disease COVID and uh, some of the side effects that we see with COVID in terms of post COVID syndrome or as Americans, as Americans would call it, long haul. But Mr. Speaker, that would all be addressed tomorrow on Friday. And there'd be lots of great news for Exuma as we build Exuma to become and take the rightful place that they deserve as they continue to expand the economy of the Bahamas and as we continue to expand that, that great island. The Speaker, I rise to address the House on the Securities Industry Amendment Bill 2021. This legislation proposes to amend the Securities Industries Act 2011 and brought into force on the 30th day of December 2011. Securities Industry Bill 2011 proposes to amend sections 29, 101, and 166, and to introduce new subsections to sections 58 and 69 of the Act. And since coming into office in 2017, improving the ease of doing business 
has been one of the key priority areas which my government has systematically and deliberately pursued. Our government remains resolute in strengthening the protection of minority investors through the implementation of the legislative amendments. The speaker objectives of the Securities Industry Amendment Bill 2021 are twofold and addresses deficiencies in the protection of minority investors regime identified in the World Bank's doing business report and to address technical gaps in the current Securities Industry Act. The speaker, the securities industry is a critical component of financial services industry in our Bahamas. As at the 31st of December, 2019, there were 164 participants in the securities industry registered with the commission to conduct various registrable activities in the securities industry. And this number was up from 157 registrants in 2018 and 2020 numbers currently under audit indicate a slight increase in spite of the COVID pandemic. As the speaker, the current securities industry legislation is administered by the Securities Commission of the Bahamas. And the commission is also responsible for the administration of the Investment Funds Act 2019, and as such, regulates, supervises, and oversees the securities and capital markets, as well as investment funds. The Commission also has regulatory control over financial and corporate services and is responsible for the administration of Financial and Corporate Services Providers Act 2020. The Commission administers the Digital Assets and Registered Exchange, Exchanges Act 2020. The speaker, allow me to provide the background for the need to amend the Act and to provide a summary of the proposed amendments. The proposed amendments are prompted by the need to address outstanding deficiencies in the protection of minority investors regime identified in the World Bank in the World Bank's doing business report. And this report compares the ease of doing business across economies. The proposed amendments will enable the Commission to address technical gaps in the Act. The proposed amendments will provide for the automatic, automatic, automatic revocation of the registration where a registrant fails to renew its registration, submit its annual filings, or to pay its annual fees as required. Speaker, the World Bank's Doing Business Project provides an analysis of domestic small and medium-sized enterprises and measures the regulatory framework applying to them through their life cycles. The project assesses and objectively scores the business regulations and enforcement of 190 economies. The final ranking of various countries assessed is published in the World Bank's Doing Business Report. Additionally, there are specific me metrics that measure efficiency of local infrastructure, access to finance, efficiency and protection in trade and in operations, legislative protections and enforcement, as well as the protection of minority investors, which these amendments specifically address. The speaker, the country's doing business ranking indicates how SME friendly 
the country is. This refers to how easy it is for entrepreneurs to start and operate a business and a robust SME friendly regime will therefore provide employment opportunities, increase productivity of the country's workforce and facilitate GDP growth. Let's speak it overall doing business ranking for the Bahamas in 2017 was 121 out of 190. In response, this government appointed a team of advisory professionals who along with the staff of Prime Minister's Delivery Unit facilitated amendments to the Companies Act, the Security and Industry, Corporate Governance Rules 2019, and the Securities Industry Takeover Rules 2019, as well as numerous other actions. And because of these actions, the Bahamas improved its ranking on the metric for the protection of minority investors from 132 to 88, a jump of 44 points. Our overall ranking and ease of doing business improved from 121 to 119 in the 2020 report. While all this showed progress, we understood that we had ways to go and there was still much more work to be done. In the speaker, in reviewing the 2019 score, various deficiencies remained in relation to the World Bank's indices related to minority rights. And as a result, further amendments were made in 2020 to the Securities Industry Corporate Governance Rules 2019 and the Securities Industry Takeover Rules 2019 and the Securities Industry Regulations 2012. These changes largely addressed the outstanding deficiencies. And Mr. Speaker, the amendments proposed by the Securities Industry Bill 2021 to section 99, 101, and 166 of the current act are intended to address the remaining outstanding deficiencies related to the protection of minority investors. And the outstanding deficiencies relate to the requirements for disclosure by the issuer of its financial statements and by material contracts and any material contracts. The amendments also make the provision of a register of public issuers mandatory as opposed to discretionary. The commission is responsible for administration of the Securities Industry Act 2011. And accordingly, the additional amendments being sought by the commission came to the attention of the commission in the course of its ordinary administration of the current Securities Industry Act. Mr. Speaker, the Commission noted certain technical gaps in relation to its ability to enforce against those failing to renew their registration in a timely and appropriate manner. The Commission is currently conducting a full review of the Securities Industry Act to assess the need to modernize the act. And still, the commission determined that this amendment was imminently required and therefore sought to amend the legislation and to address these gaps now. Speak of the substance of these amendments already exist in the other legislation administered by the commission. This will therefore create consistent consistency in the standards and obligations entrenched in the various pieces of legislation, as well as equalize the treatment of non-compliance. I note that equity is essential to good regulation. As you speak, I, I have provided the background for the impetus of the amendments. I wish to now provide 
a summary of the proposed amendment and to discuss changes this amendment bill will introduce. Mr. Speaker, the bill proposes to amend section 99, section 101 and 166 and introduces new sections 59A, 69A, 58A, 59A to the Securities Industry Act 2011. In summary, the proposed amendments, one, provide for the automatic revocation of a registration under parts five and six of the current act where a registrant fails to renew its license, submit its annual filings, or pay its annual fees. Two, provides for the disclosure of material contracts. Three, it provides a requirement for a public issuer to post its annual financial statements and auditor's reports on the company's website or in the newspaper. And four, provides that it is mandatory to make the register available to the public. Total transparency. Mr. Speaker, each of the pro proposed amendments is substantive. The need to enhance the enforcement regime to include automatic revocation of registration where registrants fail to renew their registration and to submit the required annual filing or pay their annual fees became apparent during the Commission's day-to-day -day administration of the Securities Industry Act. The Commission has historically found that it had very few options to address these failings in an efficient and an effective manner. This challenge was also identified in relation to other legislation administered by the Commission. Similar shortcomings were therefore addressed in relation to the Investment Funds Amendment Act 2020 and the Financial and Corporate Service Providers Act 2020, which are both administered by the Securities Commission. And these provisions duplicate the regimes established in those legislations. Speaker, the proposed enforcement regime provides for the automatic revocation of the registration of a marketplace or ancillary facility registered under Part 4, Part 5 of the Act, as well as person registered to conduct any of the activities registrable under Part 6 of the Act. Therefore, Registration of any registered exchange, clearing facility, or person registered to deal, arrange deals, advise, or manage securities that fails to renew their registration will automatically, will be automatically revoked should they fail to take any of these required actions. Mr. Speaker, the amendments provide that where a registered person fails to renew its registration before its annual renewed the renewal date, registration shall be automatically revoked. Further, the registrant shall be liable to pay an automatic penalty of 10% of its prescribed license fee to the commission. The additional monetary penalty is an administrative fine. And this is meant to be a deterrent and to ensure that the industry operates at its optimum compliance with licensing requirements. The registrant fails to submit its annual filings or insurance information, registration will automatically be revoked immediately. 
there will be no further redress. Where the registrant fails to pay its annual fee within 30 days of it being due, the registration will automatically be revoked. And the Speaker, the amendments also provide for the ability to restore one's registration within a 30-day period. The process and conditions for restoration include an administrative penalty to address the delinquency and provide deterrence against non-compliance. It also provides a requirement for the registrant to submit the outstanding filings or fees. Mr. Speaker, the Commission relies on registrants providing required information to do its job effectively and on a timely basis. Moreover, for the regulation to be effective, there must be real consequences for failure to meet the requirements established. And the proposed amendments will enhance the Commission's regulatory toolkit, providing swift and real consequences in the face of delinquency. Mr. Speaker, I also note that the automatic application of the penalty is applied to specific cases where breach or failure of compliance is factual and there is no room for nuance in compliance and therefore little excuse for non-compliance. The amendment is obviously quite balanced. It provides for restoration upon the payment of a small administrative penalty and a simple application requiring primarily that the registrant has addressed the deficiencies. And Mr. Speaker, having explained the amendments proposed to enhance the enforcement regime of the Act, I now turn to discuss the proposed amendments related specifically to the Doing Business Report. Let me begin with the provision to expand the disclosure requirements of public issuers to include a requirement to disclose material contracts. The speaker, the issue contemplated by the Doing Business Project is the protection of minority investors where a director of a public company has an interest in contracts executed between a public company and a third party contractor. The current legislation requires a public issuer to disclose prescribed information about its business operations to the public. And this includes significant developments about the issuer's business and any material information. There is, however, no provision which clearly provides that a director must disclose interest he or she may have in material contract with a public company on whose board he or she serves. And Mr. Speaker, it is notable that the Securities, and Securities Industry Corporate Governance Rules defines material contracts as a transaction with a value of more than 2% of the revenues of a public company. However, this definition is applicable only to the provisions regulating the disclosure of conflict of interest and not to requirements for related party transactions. The proposed amendments define material change and material contracts. The amendments clarify the distinction between the two and requires the disclosure of material contracts, thereby closing the gap in the requirement for the disclosure of third party contracts. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to discuss very briefly the proposed amendment to require public issuers to post 
audited financial statements and annual reports on the company's website or in the local newspaper. Here, the issue to be addressed in the Doing Business Report is the access to financial information by the public to ensure that there is transparency in the market so that minority interest holders are not disadvantaged by lack of information when making investment decisions. And the current Securities Industry Act requires public issuers to, find, uh, to file annual audited financial statements with the Commission. The Commission, however, does not facilitate public inspection of these statements. Mr. Speaker, the proposed amendments require, requires all public issuers to publish the annual report and audited financials that they file with the Commission. The reports can be published either on the public issuer's website or in the newspaper. This is, in fact, a simple amendment which has a major impact both on the investing public locally, both for the investing public locally, who will have the advantage of availability of information being a matter of law, as well as the benefits that the country will garner as a result of increasing its ranking on the Doing Business Report. Mr. Speaker, please allow me to again discuss very briefly the final proposed amendment. Again, this amendment is based on the need to provide accessibility and transparency. These are key elements of a good regulatory regime and thus required to improve our doing business rankings on the World Bank's survey. The final amendment proposes to make the provision of a registry for public issuers mandatory rather than discretionary. And the current legislation requires that the Commission maintains a register of prescribed information regarding the various registrants under the Act. Legislation, however, provides that the Commission may make such register available to the public on prescribed terms. This provides the Commission with the discretion of making the register public. The amendment will make access to the, to the register by the public mandatory, thereby protecting minority investors by ensuring their access to all information. This is a cornerstone, Mr. Speaker, in enabling them to make informed investment decisions. Mr. Speaker, the proposed amendment to the Securities Industry Act 2011 before us today are necessary for the continued provision of good regulation. They are necessary to keep improving our rankings in the World, World Bank's Doing Business Report. Mr. Speaker, I'd only say that with respect to the report, yes, we may have improved what appears to be small. However, within different sectors of the report, we would have improved in excess of 10 points. For example, if one were to look at um, certain sectors, energy, for example, um, business license, for example, and other issues. <clears throat> Improved ranking for the Bahamas will encourage increased investment activity and competitiveness. The Bahamas must continue to strive to be more competitive while ensuring that the regulatory environment remains robust and current. And these proposed amendments provide good regulation, set standards, that encourage investment activity and enhance the ease of doing business in the Bahamas. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm also presenting the Insurance Amendment Bill 2011 to this House. The Insurance Commission of the Bahamas is the regulatory body charged with the supervision of the insurance industry on all related matters. And the functions of the Commission include the promotion and encouragement of sound and prudent insurance management in accordance with the provisions of the Insurance Act Chapter, 1, Chapter 347 and the External Insurance Act Chapter 348. Mr. Speaker, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CF ATF, conducted an on-site examination of the Bahamas' anti-money laundering and terrorist financing regime in 2015. And this examination identified numerous gaps and deficiencies in the AML-CFD framework across the financial services sector. And following the on-site visit, a mutual evaluation report for the Bahamas was published in July 2017. The Commission has various powers as outlined in the Insurance Act, including the power to prescribe conditions of registration for insurance companies. Section 30 of the Insurance Act requires companies to obtain prior approval from the Commission whenever there is a change in the beneficial ownership of the company. However, there is no specific requirement for companies to obtain prior approval whenever there is a change in the senior management. And the CFATF considered this a deficiency in the insurance legislation. It was deemed to affect the Commission's ability to prevent criminals from doing business in the insurance sector after the initial company registration. FATF recommendations, recommendation, recommendation 26 requires that financial supervisors take the necessary legal or regulatory measures to prevent criminals or their associates from holding or being the beneficial owner holding a management function in a company. It was determined that insurance companies should obtain prior approval from the Insurance Commission for any change in senior management in the company to mitigate against this risk. Mr. Speaker, in carrying out its power to supervise insurance companies under the Insurance Act, the Commission determined that it was necessary to require insurance companies to obtain prior approval of the Commission whenever there is a change in senior management within a company. This requirement is important to the Commission in the exercise of its mandate to properly supervise its licensees for both prudential and AML CFT purposes. The proposed, the proposed amendment to section 28 and 30 of the Insurance Act would achieve this end. Mr. Speaker, before I close, I want to extend condolence to the family of Dr. John Lund, who has just passed away. When I came here as an intern, I worked under Dr. Lund while he was a consultant in charge of the medical department. And I learned quite a bit from him as he was very interested in teaching not only junior doctors, but students also. He had made great contribution to the field of medicine, especially in cancer research. And um, as an internal specialist. Dr. Dan, Dr. Lan and myself, along with other personnel, personalities, met pre-COVID 
every Friday at certain places where we spoke and had a joyous time. And I'm certain, Mr. Speaker, that I extend condolence to his wife, Sonia, his children, grandchildren, and the land family, not only on behalf of myself, my family, and my parliamentary colleagues, but also on behalf of that dinner group who meets every Friday pre-COVID, and we look forward to meeting again post-COVID. And um, Dr. Lund would be greatly missed, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, again, I want to remind those in Exuma that as we have the groundbreaking for the new airport so as to remove many of the guests who are island inclusive of the humans from the exposure of the elements of the environment at their new airport with um, experience the groundbreaking and subsequently commence. And uh, we hope to do the same to uh, um, Lutra quite soon after the field follow on to Long Island. And um, I would be I am more on most honored to deliver the news to Exuma as we would talk about their new township and their futuristic development with all the other infrastructural amenities and their advancement to first world status as they perform in such manner. But Mr. Speaker, before I close, allow me to wish all the mothers of the Bahamas and throughout the world a happy Mother's Day on Sunday. And Mr. Speaker, my greatest regret is that I am not able to spend such nor with my mother, lady whom I was most friendly and my most confident person and one whom I loved very dearly. It's not a word that I use commonly, but I can say that she is a woman I love, I respect, I admired and will be missed daily. And in keeping with a Mother's Day tradition, I most certainly will visit her grave upon my return from Elutra, both her grave and that of my sister, whom I consider my second mother. When we speak, I cannot stand here and talk long about my mother because Memories of her bring tears to my eyes, and I can ill afford such tears at this time during a COVID era. So, Mr. Speaker, with those few words that I uttered today, with respect to the amendments of the two bills being presented as a compendium, I so move and I now present the Insurance Amendment Bill 2021 to this house. That is just referring to long titles, Securities Industry Amendment Bill 2021 and the Insurance Amendment Bill 2021. I so move. Thank you, Honorable Member. To recognize this Honorable Member for Yamabro. Thank you, Thank you, Reverend. Uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Let me let me say it's a delight to stand in this honourable place, Mr. Speaker, and second uh, this debate uh, this morning on a bill for an act to amend the Securities Industries Act, only Securities Industries Amendment Bill 2021, 
um, the Insurance Amendment Bill 2021. You can take this opportunity to, and I stand on behalf of the good people of the constituency of the Armour Cross. Mr. Speaker, let me commend uh, the member for Kalani for a comprehensive presentation uh, that's representative of the level of consultation that industry has brought to bear on the two pieces of legislation presented here this morning. Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to speak with none other than Ms. Christine Roland last evening as we were uh, having just a short discussion on the securities industry bill. And she outlined uh, the support of industry for the proposed amendment, amendments that we have here today. Speaker, I just, I crave your indulgence just to make mention of a few items, Mr. Speaker, before going into debate, to the debate this morning. First, I would like to recognize, Mr. Speaker, three persons in the Royal Bahamas Supreme Court that are near and dear to me. And they are in the persons of uh, Ms. Shanta Knowles, who is Chief Superintendent in charge of CDU. Pardon me? Uh, Ms. Sabrina Porter. Uh, Ms. Sabrina Porter, who is second in charge, uh, and they are my senior coordinates. We went into training in 1990. And then there is Mr. Michael Johnson, who is the third gentleman. He's the, he's the gentleman that's in charge of homicide uh, in the Criminal Investigation Department. These are persons of great integrity and high moral standing. And my colleagues, the Minister of National Security, would have spoken to this issue uh, some weeks back when they were swirling in the environment that they are uh, alleging the pure street shop talk uh, branded by myself and no less a person than the Minister of National Security is pure nonsense of extrajudicial killing uh, in the Bahamas. And so I want to commend my three squad mates uh, for the stellar performance, selfless performance, uh, and sacrifice that they've been giving to the people of the Bahamas, to the Royal Bahamas Police Force. And I have to thank you. And to also uh, say, congratulate my squad mate, Mr. Oscar Marquis, who is now living the life of the rich and famous, and is now residing in Long Island. And I know Adrian is taking, yes. And so I want to say to him that Jay squad, led by none other than Sergeant Larry Roll, sends our love uh, uh, to him. Mr. Speaker, I would like to also send condolences out to my cousin, to my cousin, my grandfather, my grand uncle, Mr. David Poitier, his daughter, his pet leader, Wilson, uh, her son, Marco Wilson, who I grew up with on Cat Island, passed away in his sleep. Up is David Poitier, uh, you know, Pastor Rita, her son, uh, Marco Wilson, who worked at, uh, I think worked at BPL. He passed in his sleep. He passed, Marco passed, uh, Saturday morning, Friday morning, Friday morning. I thought you knew about it. I thought, I thought you knew about Okay, yeah. So on behalf of uh, my family and I, and indeed the Dow's community, uh, I want to extend condolences to my cousin, Pastor Rita. Well, all of us are, are, are mourning uh, the loss of Marco. I love, we love him and I cherish him. And so I thank you very much. Speaker, as I said earlier, I commended the member for Kalani for such a brilliant and Comprehensive presentation on the presentation on the bill laid before us today, and I'm not going to be very long, Speaker. They're short amendments, even though short, Speaker, they're very significant because they help to highlight uh, and bolster our value proposition that we have sold to the world uh, about the Bahamas. That is our location 
and the Bahamas being a transparent, clean, and friendly jurisdiction for persons to do, to, to do financial services. So Mr. Speaker, in addressing this matter, I'll look briefly at the role of the, both the Securities Commission and the Insurance Commission to uh, police the to police the industry, the securities industry, uh, and the insurance industry to ensure that persons participating or conducting business uh, within uh, the two industries uh, will do so in a manner that is acceptable by international standards. And so, Mr. Speaker, the attempt is always, not the attempt, our uh, obligation is always to perform our duties or to conduct our business in a way that those issues that are identified as identified risks, whether it be money laundering, terrorism financing, trafficking in person, cybercrime, corruption, that those entities are not given uh, an opportunity to thrive within our jurisdiction. So, Mr. Speaker, I will take you briefly through the provisions of the Act that Amar Kalani uh, ably dealt with and just speak through the amendments as they are laid. Section 2 of the um, uh, amends, Section 58 of the Act, Mr. Speaker, is deals with automatic rev revocation. Section 58 of the Act. Section 58 of the Act, that, that section, or that part, speaks to regulation of the marketplace and persons doing business within the marketplace, Mr. Speaker. And what Section 5A says, Mr. Speaker, is that this regulation, the regulation of a person under this section shall be automatically revoked where that regulated person fails to renew the registration prior uh, to the annual renewal date. I speak, I think, I know, as industry accepts, that it's about time to say the person that the rules and regulations of the security industry must be obeyed. And in order to have that done, Mr. Speaker, there's no other way to say the question that if they're not going to renew their license within a timely fashion, and obviously renewal of a, the renewal of a license require certain uh, regularities or certain uh, steps to be put in place, certain important requirements uh, are to be made to the Commission. And if they are not prepared to do that, then automatically, if you don't meet that renewal application date, that your app, your 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 automatically your license is automatically revoked. Revoke. Section B says that if this if that the regulation of a person under this section shall be automatically the registration, sorry, of a person shall be automatically revoked where that regulated regulated person fails to submit the subscribed annual update and declaration form. And in order for us uh, pursuant to all of the requirements by the EU, the Financial Action Task Force, the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, and for the Commission to play its regulatory role. Uh, it cannot be overstressed that persons are expected in a timely manner to submit uh, the prescribed annual update and declaration forms properly filled out in due form. And so if they do not comply with that, it's automatically uh, revoked. And where the applicable, where the, where the, it would also be revoked, where applicable, where that individual does not submit to the Securities Commission a copy of their insurance policy. And that is to protect persons doing business with them, Mr. Speaker. And if they don't do this, 
two, two, three things about their licenses will be automatically revoked. And where they do not pay the annual fee for more than 30 days after the annual renewal date, Mr. Speaker, there is the prescribed automatic revocation by this bill of the registration of that person. And Mr. Speaker, next to that, I place uh, the Bahamas Bar Association. And I hope that someday in the very near future, I remember when I was Bar President, Mr. Speaker, one of the most difficult things we had at the bar, and, and the member for Kett Island, Ron King from Salvador, can attest that he's the former president of the Bahamas Bar Association. I don't know, back then they paid it. They paid their due on time. Yeah, but it's very difficult to have it done now. But a part of being a part of industry for sure that you're not a bankrupt and you're able to fully participate in the industry. So it, it has an automatic revocation clause is being introduced uh, where persons in a heavily regulated industry are not prepared uh, to follow the rules. Section 5B states as follows, an automatic penalty of 10% of the prescribed annual fee will then be uh, allotted to the person for their failure to follow the regulations and submit uh, the registration form uh, or renew annually and submit the, reg the necessary the necessary declaration form. Mr. Speaker, the bill also gives the commission uh, the authority to restore persons once they comply with within a certain prescribed time uh, of this act to have them restored to the to to the register. And the reason is follows, Mr. Speaker. Where a registration has been revoked pursuant to Section 5A, the Commission may restore the registration if, within 30 days of the revocation date, the regulated person applies in writing to the Commission for restoration, pays the administrative penalty of 20% of the annual fee due, and as applicable, submits the annual update and declaration forms, submit a copy of the regulated person's insurance policy or pays the outstanding annual fees. So, Mr. Speaker, in order to satisfy not just you know, there are those who have just been speaking about these matters, speak about our national our national obligation to protect the value proposition that we offer the persons around the world to say that we're doing uh, business in a clean, transparent way, indicating that we're not giving quarter to money launderers, terrorism financiers, financiers, persons who traffic in person, uh, cyber persons who are engaging in cyber crime and or corruption, that we're not giving quarter to that. And so to ensure that persons are strictly adhering to the rules with the people, I think no, but there's no better way than to give the Securities Commission the power to immediately revoke their licenses. Uh, and basically, it's a small ban, ban them from practicing if they do not comply with uh, the laws and regulations of the Securities Commission, who are fully, and that commission being fully authorized by law to police the securities industry. Mr. Speaker, Section 69. I speak to regulations for persons carrying on securities business. And Mr. Speaker, again, uh, Section 69 is amended, uh, and it reads as follows. Uh, Section 69 of the Principal Act is amended by the insertion immediately after Subsection 11 of the following subsection, that is, the registration of a person just under this section shall be automatically revoked where that person fails, again, renew the registration prior to the annual uh, renewal, submit the prescribed annual update and declaration form. Where applicable, submit a current copy of the registrant's insurance policy for the commission or pay the prescribed annual fee for more than 30 days after annual renewal date. So 
that makes it specific in the procedure for to regulate for the regulation of persons carrying on business and security business. That they must understand that if they don't pay, and I'm 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 gonna even though I'm discussing this, I want to give the bar president and my colleagues at the bar a little push that where a person uh, are not prepared to play by the rules, then there's an automatic uh, a revocation of their license. Mr. Speaker. And so it goes on to give a penalty, again, at, uh, in the previous section, and then it speaks to uh, restoring that individual, and it says where registration is being revoked, if you want to subject in 11 a, the commission may restore the registration if within 30 days of the revocation date, the, re the registrant does the follow-up, and those matters that we made mention of before, where they apply in writing to the commission, pays an administrative penalty of 20%. As applicable, submit the annual update and declaration forms. And it's very important because the annual update and declaration form is like an audit. So you can see what they've been doing for the past year. And you could really, uh, and then you can assist because we have uh, cross-border reporting obligations. When persons do not comply with the rules, and that's they are a sister country wants to get information. If you're not keeping your records updated, then the, the security commission who can be called on by the regulators to say, hey, we need to provide, let's say, a country X or country Y information. They cannot provide it because they're not running a tight ship. So they, these just that's just one of the reasons why why we do it. And also, as I, I say. We always say when we debate these matters, the financial services represent 15% uh, of our gross domestic product. It undergirds uh, a large portion of our middle class. And we want to ensure that there is an industry that is transparent, that is properly operating for those persons to, to work to support their families. And so there is an, an opportunity for restoration. I think I now move to section four. Uh, of the proposed amendment, which speaks to the repeal and replacement of uh, Section 99 of the Act. Section 99 of the Act repeal as follows, and it makes provision for timely disclosure of material of material change and material contract. Speaker, this is extremely important in terms of monitoring the person who are participating in the industry and also monitor ensuring that there is no insider trading or that minority shareholders are not being taken advantage of. Uh, and, and to also protect confidentiality as best we can. But, and as I was reading through this act, I, was, I thought about uh, the watchword uh, in the police, in the police, in the police legislation, which is to prevent uh, the check uh, apprehend. So what you want to do is to prevent any opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for money laundering, terrorism financing, uh, the, 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 the funding of weapons of mass uh, destruction, uh, or trafficking in person, uh, for cyber crime, or any form of corruption. And so this, these legislation uh, even create that legitimate or lawful incursion into the activities of industry so that we can prevent uh, the check. And in some circumstances that we've seen before the court, apprehend uh, offenders who may uh, be inclined to launder or disadvantage uh, persons in industry who uh, want to practice and protect their resources. And so it says, Subsection, section, subsection, subject to section two, where a material change occurs in the affairs of a public issue, or where a material contract is entered into with a public issue, and the director of the issue, a party or beneficiary to the contract, the issuer has an obligation to disclose, and that is fundamental because we would want to know uh, what persons are doing. We do it, we're supposed to do it, and I do it. Uh, say what 
It is if we own what we don't, then person should know what we don't own. And so that at the end of the day, we're able to uh, perform our services to the being the people as we ought to, and not be joined us uh, by obligations to other entities. And so that is basically what is happening here. In order to protect uh, minority shareholders, you would want to know uh, if there's a contract that is entered into, whether or not persons are intending to disadvantage individuals. And so it says, immediately, in any event, within one day of the material change occurring or upon becoming aware of the director's interest in the material contract, issue a press release that discloses the nature and substance of the contract and the director's connection thereto. Plain, simple, nobody could get that wrong. And file a report with commission in the prescribed form within five days of the issuing of the press release. So there's a double disclosure of issue, and then you will file a report with the, with, the, with, the, with the commission. It provides that where the speaker in section two, uh, where the public issuer is of the opinion that the disclosure required to be unduly detrimental to his interest, uh, it can make that known to the commission. And then the commission can have a hearing speaker to make that to make the determination as to whether or not uh, the disclosure would not be unduly detrimental to the individual. But it's all intended, Mr. Speaker, but there's no there's, there's no appeal from the commission. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the intent here uh, is normally when persons are given lectures, they would say, and I'm not giving a lecture, I'm just breaking it down. Uh, they say, what does it mean? It means that you want people to be honest. You don't want them to take what they don't own. You don't want them, in this circumstance with the legislation, not to get an unreasonable advantage. That advantage, uh, that contract, or whatever have you, contributing to the disadvantage of persons who are participating in the industry. So you don't want people to be having two masters, Mr. Speaker. And it says, as I said earlier, that the decision of the commission is final. The section five says, notwithstanding any any permitted non-disclosure on the succession two and three, the public issuer shall disclose such material change no later than 30 days following the date on which the public issuer would have been required to issue the press release. As a disaster, the commission would have said, listen, you have an obligation. I've given you an opportunity to be heard. If you've heard of your determination, you must now disclose so that everybody could see. And if you're doing something uh, and the light is turned on, uh, you should not have to scurry away. So uh, section six says the public issue shall not be standing a report. Southern shall, shall not be standing a report has been given to the commissioner on section two, promptly disclose the material change in the manner referred to in, in A. So yes, to just disclose tell everybody about the nature of the contract. And section seven, speak to the speaker and explain to what a material change means. I must read it for the interest of the public. For the purpose of this section, a material change means any change in any material information regarding the public issuer that impacts the corporate governance matter of the issuer the price of the shares or investor decision to buy or to sell shares. And that is very material, Mr. Speaker. So you want to know that the corporate governance is in change, the directing mind and will that you're not making decisions that are best in your interest or in the best of the best interest of, of, of some somebody else. And you know, uh, Bernie Madoff, uh, he just passed away. Uh, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes ever. You don't want to have Ponzi schemes being created. You don't find out that years after. And a lady who, who I wish I could have taken a fucking Miss Martha Stewart, uh, there were certain things that she would have done. Uh, and you don't want that type of activity going on in an industry where people are making decisions that are best in their industry and in their interest. 
are not in the best interest of the structures that they they're called upon to govern. And so the Security Commission is empowered to ensure that uh, these matters are properly dealt with. I think I need now uh, move to section five of the proposed amendment, which speaks to financial statements to be posted in his website. So I think that's, that's fundamental. That's how we are, we don't post uh, stuff on the website, uh, but we are required to submit uh, our disclosures and the companies because you don't want a company in your jurisdiction. That is so, that, and you're inviting persons from all around the world to participate in your securities industry. Uh, and then persons, they're, they're withholding vital information that uh, possible investors may, may should have sight of in order to make reasonable decisions as to whether or not they are going to engage with them. Uh, and I want to always bring it down to our value proposition. A clean, pristine, jurisdiction where we're inviting persons to come live, work, and do business. Our value proposition also speaks to uh, the independence of our judiciary, the strength of our people, the serenity uh, and peacefulness of our country and people in our family of Ireland. And so, the speaker, so you would want companies that represent and resonate with that product that we're selling around the world. So the financial statement will be posted on the website. And let me just read it. Every financial statement referred to in section one shall be accompanied by a report of the auditor of the public issuer and the public issuer shall, upon filing the annual financial statement and auditor's report with the commission, cause the financial statement to be posted on the company's website or in a newspaper. And so it says that there's openness. Uh, there's one can see whether or not there's clarity of thought. Uh, and having regard to all of the other provisions and all of the other provisions in the Securities Act, it protects the minority shareholders and all persons doing business in industry. Mr. Speaker, I now take you to Section 6, uh, uh, which amends Section 66, the Commission to keep or the Commission. Uh, keep, red, shall keep or make uh, access to the registry mandatory at one time it was made. And now the legislation makes it mandatory uh, that the registry is kept uh, public. So the Act makes public access to the register of current and former regulated persons uh, kept by the Commission. <coughs> mandatory rather than permissible. So, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the ease of doing business, when we speak to the ease of doing business, uh, persons think about going and doing things quickly, but the ease of doing business also speaks uh, to person, the person, the does. So, but the ease of business also speaks to individuals who are involved in industry, Mr. Speaker. Being comfortable in the fact that they're investing, applying their resources in an industry, and that nothing uncanny, nothing untoward will happen to it. And so, separate, because you could have stealth. I've, 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 and all of us have seen stealth in business where money seems to disappear very quickly. And that's the ease of doing business uh, for some people that you may not, that you don't want around you. So there are persons who are able to disappear your funds very quickly without, without one knowing what it is. But when I speak to the ease of doing business, it means that one, the building stealth, swiftness into it but there's one can rest assured or have that level of comfort that in doing business in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, that the Securities Commission is sufficiently empowered uh, by legislation to protect their industry. Right? And so these amend proposed amendments to speak here today, the automatic revocation of persons uh, in industry, uh, 
the regulation of persons carrying on business, uh, securities business, automatic revocation. The disclosure of material changes and material contracts. Financial statements to be po uh, posted on the company's website. The commission uh, shall keep uh, registers for persons to be able to, to uh, inspect and for international regulatory bodies to be able to inspect. Uh, and it will, it will, it will, what it also does is it relaxes, and it doesn't relax, but it assists in, in terms of the reporting requirement because if not just the local community, but, I, but international uh, clients or our regulatory uh, bodies are able to go to the website or go to a company's website and get information readily. It decreases uh, the need to expend resources uh, to go to the court to get uh, orders to get the self-same information. So, Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the Insurance uh, Amendment Bill 2021. And, Mr. Speaker, it's a very short amendment, uh, but it's critical uh, to the industry. And as the member for Galani highlighted, uh, this was highlighted by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force. The Financial Action Task Force, the OECD and others, and not only just that, but led and we're led in the charge by the industry practitioners in terms of how we conduct transparent business in the Bahamas in section, uh, I'll go to section three, Sec well, section two uh, of this bill, I mean, section eight of the principal act, section three, I mean, section 30 of the principal act, section 30, Section 30 of the Act is amended by the deletion and substitution of the following. No company shall register on this Act. No company registered on this Act shall in any way affect a change in beneficial ownership or senior management without the prior approval of the Commission. And that is to ensure, as the member for Kalani says, you don't want a various person, criminal a person who are intending to spirit away assets or find lodging in the Bahamas to do their work uh, to be able to do that. Mr. Speaker, the Caribbean indulgence, I, I know that the time bell is wrong, but just to express uh, and extend a happy Mother's Day to my mother, uh, Ms. Sadie Dossett, who is resident in Dallas, Cat Island, my auntie, Vernice, who I grew up with, and all of the ladies, Aunt Nika and Jenny, uh, and all of those ladies, Cosette and Cosette, for those who have passed, I live in a, in a, I grew up in a community, of, you know, governed by them. I, want, I just want to say happy Mother's Day again. She tell mommy that I love her. I put a box on the boat. So I know she's yeah. looking forward. <laughs> I, Ms. Speaker, I'm so happy that at this stage of my life, I remember as a boy, I see my mother going to work. And I promise her one day, and just like Kalani, uh, my good friends at Southern Shores and everybody that's here, all of us who come from humble beginnings and saw our mothers work, live for the day when we could assist. And my aunt, who I grew up with, who would turn cornmeal for me, I was able to put a box on the boat for her. And that did my heart glad to be able to do that. And, you know, it, it's not, and they don't expect me because they know my financial Trapping to put gold or silver there, but it's the it's the thought that comes. And I was able to call and say, "Hey, what do you want to eat on Sunday?" And you know, they just don't want anything, and I splurge. <laughs> <laughs> so, mommy, I love you. Uh, to all the women of this country who have done so much to assist us, and sometimes we forget that. You know, the men they played their part. They went away to to, to the contract. There are many mothers who are single mothers. And when I go to my headquarters, I say, and you're, you're single mothers who put in that time and through no fault of their own, 
uh, and they would have been left alone. Some with two, three, four, five children, and they work miracles. Sometimes all you could hear is the prayers of those women, and they stood strong, and you see them. And so I want to thank my mother. I want to express uh, happy Mother's Day greetings to all of the women uh, in Yamapro. There's a young lady by the name of Ms. Campbell who assists young females or young women who have children long before they ought to have children. And sometimes they're abandoned. And I want to celebrate persons like Ms. Campbell and those older ladies in the community who see that and who take those children and, mo and mother them. And so on this coming Saturday, again, as we do uh, every Mother's Day, we will be on Trinum Park, and we will also be on Australia Park, and we will be preparing lunch uh, for the mothers, and we'll be playing uh, all of the good uh, Mother's Day music. Sweet Sadie, that would be my favorite. And I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know you know that. Don't you know I love you, Sweet Sadie? Uh, Two Pop, yeah, Mama. Shirley sees I always, I don't like listening to that one spring. That's made me cry. No charge. We be, that gave me goose pimples. We'll be playing those songs. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mother. And I just want to end by saying this. Longfellow knew what he was saying when he spoke about Christ and his experience. And he said, even he in his great agony and all that he experienced during the crucifixion and all of the disappointments that he was full man even before he left this earth to go back to his father, he saw that his mother was protected. He says, mother, here go your son. Son, this is your mother. And he respected that holy and divine union of mother to child. So may God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Remember to stay safe. We are a strong people. We have maneuvered through Irma. And this is, and I just think long before, Irma is just recent. I think the strength of our people before that, they had to come to the Burma Road riot when these halls were not even prepared for us. They did it when schooling wasn't for us, when health care wasn't for us. And so if they could have done all of that, when what was for us was sometimes rape and ostracization, they made it to that. And they are, we are now their dream and their aspiration, as Maya, Maya Angelo said. So today, I see why we have the strength uh, to make it through. Dorian, COVID-19 and beyond. Stay safe, get vaccinated, uh, practice the protocol, and I'm quite certain, as I would say to my, and to all the women in the ministry, happy Mother's Day. I know sometimes being the permanent secretary, we would have our discussions. I really love her. As you would say, oh, minister, this minister, I say, will it affect the second coming? He said, no, minister. I said, because the second coming happens, I'm gone. <laughs> and the food stays. They would not be interested in any hour. <laughs> but happy Mother's Day, uh, Ms. Miller, uh, the director, deputy director who's now in charge of, of the, Ms. Ferguson in charge of the immigration department, all of the officers who work so hard, and sometimes you don't get your due diligence, Ms. Donkinson, Ms. Watson, Ms. Pinder, uh, all of you ladies, thank you very much, and may God continue to bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Chair recognizes the honorable member for Southern Shores. Mr. Speaker, on such a beautiful note, and in light of the time, I am satisfied that there is no choice but to move that the business of this house suspends for the luncheon break and that we return at 3 p.m. today's date. Thank you, honorable members. It has been moved and seconded that the business of this house do suspend until 3 p.m. this afternoon. As many members that are in favor will remain seated, those who oppose will stand. The business of this house stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon.